Muracyumva radio ijwi rya America ivugira Washington DC mu Kirundi n'Ikinyarwanda. Shuti zacu mwiriwe neza. Polisi ya Tanzania yaraye yishe abantu batanu bakekwa ko arabagizi banabi bo mu nkambi y'impunzi y'abarundi ya Nduta. Eneo hili la ujambazi limetokea maeneo ya karibu na kambi ya wakimbizi ya Nduta ambayo ina wakimbizi kutoka nchini Burundi. Uyu ni ACP James Manyama, commandant wa polisi ya Tanzania ichigoma. Abarundi barenga magana bili na mirongi tanda tu bara yabata ahute bava munghambi imunzi ya na kivale muri Uganda. Ijihembu ochitirwe Nobel mubutavire shimi chahawe umudaje Benjamin List numu nya Amerika David Macmillan. Izini njinguzi njenziza makurutu kwa bateguri ya muru yunganya ikaze murikumga na Thomas Kamirindi. Amakuru yo hirya no hino kwisi tuyahere muri Republika ya Centre Afrika abantu 12 barishwe mu gico cy'inyeshyamba kuri iyi nkuru dutega matwi Fidel Niyongabo abo bantu biswe igihe abagwanya ubutegetsi batega bakongera bagaturira makamyo yari atwaye abantu bakuye mu gisagara cha Alindao abajanye mu gisagara cha Bambari muri komine ya Uwaka uretse abapfuye abandi batari bake barakomeretse nkuko bitangazwa n'umukuru w'iyo komine Victor Bisekoin amenyesha ko bisa nuko abakomeretse batazorokoka amasana mu yaherekanijwe ku mbuga ngurukana mumenyi yerekanye ikamyo yahiye ikikujwe n'ibiziga by'abantu batari munsi ya 10 tokanizo rya makuru ryo mu bwongereza Reuters ryashoboye kwemeza ko ayo masanamu arayukuri userukira inteko zijeje ucungera umutekano muri Republika ya Centre Afrika zizwe ku izina rya Minuska yaremeje ko igitero cyo kumunsi wa kabiri cyabaye yamara ntabirengangaho yashikirije Republika ya Centre Afrika yarageramiwe n'ubwicanyi kuva President François Bozize akuwe ku butegetsi mu mwaka wa 2013 abantu bihumbi nibihumbi baravuye mu zabo kubera ubwicanyi n'uruhagarara muri cyo gihugu Igihembo kitiriwe Nobel mu butabire cyangwa shibi cyahawe umudaje Benjamin List n'umunya Amerika David Macmillan Benjamin List yavukiye i Frankfurt mu Budage ku itariki ya 11 y'ukwezi kwa mbere igihumbi 1968 akora mu kigo cy'ubushakashatsi kitwa Max Planck Institute mu Budage Nao David Macmillan yavukiye i Belchil mu Bwongereza ku itariki ya 16 y'ukwa gatatu igihumbi 1968 yigisha ubutabire muri kaminuza ya Princeton muri leta zunze ubumwe za Amerika bazagabana mo kabiri igihembo bahawe bahembewe ko bavumbuye uburyo bubunga bunga ibidukikije mu gukora uturema ngingo twitwa molecule bituma gukora imiti imwe nimwe byihuta inshuro ebyiri kurusha mu myaka 22 ishize umwaka ushize komite nobel yahaye igihembo nobel cy'ubutabire umufransa kazi Emmanuel Charpentier n'umunya Amerika kazi Jennifer Doudna nubwa mbere mu mateka igihembo nobel mu bya science cyari gihawe itsinda ry'abagore bonyine gusa nta mugaburimo nyuma yo gutangaza abahembwe mu by'ubuganga ejo bundi kwa mbere mu by'ubugenge ejo bundi kwa kabiri no mu by'ubutabire uyu munsi kwa gatatu komite nobel izatangaza ejo kwa kane uzahembwa cyangwa se abazahembwa mu by'ubuganditsi Radio ijwi rya Amerika tugarure Fidel Niyongabo kandi tujyane muri Ethiopia aho ministri w'intebe Abiy Ahmed yagumijeho ministri w'imari ya leta muri guverinoma yensha yagumije kandi mu bamanga yiwe umushikiranganda jeje ku migenderanire yamara yahinduye abashikiranganje mu bindi bibanza aho yashizemwo abayobo bimigambwe mito mito ibiri leta ya Abiy Ahmed yatsinze amatora yo kwezi kwa gatandatu ku uyu mwaka n'amajwi menshi cyane yabwiye inama nshinga mateka ko naho afise ibyo adahuriye ko nabayobo imigambwe itavuga rumwe na leta botekerezwa gukorera hamwe amenyesha ko bizo fashe migambwe yabo muri kazoza ngwano mu ntare ya Tigreya ni kimwe mu bibazo bitari bike leta shasha yiwe izotegerezwa kwicarira ubutunzi bw'igihugu bwigeze kuba ari bumwe mu byiyongera ningo gacane mu karere ka Afrika mu kiringo cy'imyaka 10 busa nuburiko urazama Asnake Kefale yigisha ibyerekeye politike muri kaminuza Addis Ababa University avuga ko leta ya Abi Ahmed ari akigoro kugushiraho runani amenyesha ko byerekana ugushaka kwiwe kugushiraho leta atawikumira
Radio ijwi rya Amerika ivugira Washington DC mu Kirundi ni Kinyarwanda mu Rwanda muradukurikira kuri FM ijana na kane n'ibice bitatu mu Burundi muratwumvira ku mirongo migufi metero 19 na 22 aho muri hose kandi mudukurikira no kuri internet waishatu akadomo radio ya chuvewa akadomo com no kuri YouTube na Facebook VOA Radio yacu maze mukurikire amakuru n'ibiganiro byacu Amakuru y'ibiyaga bigari muri Tanzania abantu batanu bakekwa ko ari impunzi z'abarundi bo mu nkambi ya Ndutabara yebishwe ni gipolisi muri komine Kibondo polisi yabafatanye imbunda ivuga ko bakoreshaga ubujura mu mihanda umunyamakuru w'ijwi rya Amerika muri Tanzania James Jovin arabiduhaneza Ivyo vyemezwa n'umurongozi mukuru w'igipolisi mu ntara Kigoma ICP James Manyama mu nama n'abanyamakuru yabereye mu biro by'igipolisi komune Kibondo kuri uyu gatatu bwana Manyama yavuze ko iyo sanganya yabaye ku mugoro wa wejo kwa kabiri ahitwa rusohoko ibirometero hafi 15 uvuye mu nkambi ya Ndutu avuga ko abo bagizi banabi bari ko baritegura gukora ibitero byo kunyaga abantu mu modokari zicaho hama bagira umugisha mubi modokari ya mbere bateze iba igipolisi bose ko ari batanu nibaramenyekana amazina yabo ariko ngo baboneka yuko bafise imyaka hagati ya 25 na 40 yavuze yuko basanganywe inkoho zibiri ibipanga hamwe n'amabombe mato mato atatu eneo hili la ujambazi limetokea maeneo ya karibu na kambi ya wakimbizi ya Nduta ambayo ina wakimbizi kutoka nchini Burundi. Icho gitero cyabere hafi cyane inkambi y'impunzi za Burundi Nduta ni urabarali kuru riva komune Kibondo rija mu yindi komune ya Gasuru. Abantu barenga batanu ukeka ko arabagize bana bari bateze amabuye hamwe n'ibiti mu nzira. Imodoka yabaye ya mbere gucaho yari igipolisi. Uvyihuse ntibayimenye kubera isa nk'izi sanzu. Abapolisi bari muri iyo modoka bakiye bakora akazi kabo na ningoka. Abakozi banabi babiri bapfiriye aho nyene. Abandi batatu bapfiriye mu bitaro. Abo tutamenye gitigiri cyabo bari rutse. Wawa watu wawili ambao waliondoka sehemu ya tukio huku wengine wakiwa wana What's great about this project is that I not only get to help cool down my neighborhood by teaching said Merritt. Some day with those trees I'll be able to feed my neighbors too. I'm Faith Perlo and I'm Dan Friedel. Next is this week's science report with Brian Lynn. Listen closely. I will have a question for you to answer after we hear the report. A new study suggests that ancient Mars might have been able to support a large population of microscopic organisms. French scientists used computer models to predict climate and land conditions under the planet's surface about 4 billion years ago. The study said the microorganisms might have been growing just beneath the Martian surface. The microbes could have been covered by several centimeters of dirt. This would have protected them from severe radiation. The researchers said any place free of ice on Mars could have been filled with the living organisms. But if they did exist, these simple life forms would have changed the atmosphere so much that they would not have survived the new environment. Boris Sautere was the lead writer of the study which recently appeared in the publication Nature Astronomy. He is a postdoctoral researcher at Sorbonne University in Paris. Sautere said that in the time period studied 
Mars was thought to contain lots of water and had less severe conditions than today. But he told the Associated Press the research results present a picture of how things can develop in the universe. Sautere said that life on Mars, even simple life like microbes, might actually commonly cause its own demise. He added that while the findings might seem a bit gloomy, he also finds them exciting. The researchers said ancient Mars likely had a wet, warm climate. But this environment would have been threatened by large amounts of hydrogen being removed from the thin, carbon dioxide-rich atmosphere. Temperatures then dropped by about minus 200 degrees Celsius. The researchers said any organisms at or near the surface would likely have buried themselves deeper underground in an attempt to survive. This is unlike Earth, where microbes may have helped keep climate conditions more moderate. Researchers say this is because Earth had an atmosphere rich in nitrogen. Kave Polivan is a planetary scientist at the SETI Institute, a non-profit space research center in California. He told the AP he thinks any future models of Mars climate should consider the new French research. Pallavan recently led a separate study suggesting Mars was born wet with warm oceans that lasted millions of years. At the time, the atmosphere would have been dense and mostly hydrogen. But over time, some gases were likely transported higher into the atmosphere and lost to space. The French study investigated the climate effects of possible microbes when Mars' atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide. So Pallavan said the research would not relate to earlier times. What their study makes clear, however, is that if this life were present on Mars during this earlier period, they would have had a major influence on the prevailing climate, Pallavan said. The French researchers offered some suggestions about where to look on Mars for signs of past life. They named the Hellas Planitia area as well as around Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is where the American Space Agency, NASA's exploring vehicle, Perseverance, is carrying out research activities. Next, Sautere said he would like to begin research into the possibility that microbial life could still exist deep within Mars. I'm Brian Lynn. Thanks, Brian. Now, here is a question for our listeners. How did Boris Sotere say ancient Mars was different from the Mars of today? Did he say, A, the planet had a more severe climate, B, the planet likely contained a lot more water, or C, there were fewer living organisms on the planet? The answer is B. You can take a full quiz about Brian's report by visiting our website, learningenglish.voanews.com.
from VOA Learning English. Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. In our last program, we talked about President Thomas Jefferson's decisions about who would be in his new government. Jefferson was the leader of a new political party, the Republican Party, but not the Republican Party we know today. In fact, Jefferson's party laid the roots for today's Democratic Party. During the election of 1800, the Jeffersonian Republicans struggled bitterly with the opposition party, the Federalists. Jefferson won that election. In his inaugural address of 1801, he said he wanted to work with the Federalists for the good of the nation. But he chose no Federalists for his cabinet. All the cabinet officers were strong Republicans. All were loyal to Thomas Jefferson. Once President Jefferson formed his cabinet, he began planning the policies of his administration. Jefferson, of course, thought central government should be almost invisible. Um, he saw its prime role as acting as a sort of referee between the various uh, states and he wanted to keep it to a minimum. Andrew O'Shaughnessy directs a Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home in Virginia. He says Jefferson was especially concerned about the public debt. In the first year of Jefferson's presidency, the government owed millions of dollars. Each year, the debt grew larger because of the interest charged on these loans. Jefferson wanted to balance the budget. Jefferson discussed his financial policy with his two closest advisors. The advisors were Secretary of State James Madison and Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin. The men agreed that the government must stop spending as much money as it did under former President John Adams. And they agreed that the government must pay its debts as quickly as possible. Albert Gallatin said... We must have a strong policy. The debt must be paid. If we do not do this, our children, our grandchildren, and many generations to come will have to pay for our mistakes. Jefferson began saving money by cutting unnecessary jobs in the executive branch. He reduced the number of ambassadors and he dismissed all the tax inspectors. Congress would have to take the next steps. Most government offices, Jefferson said, were created by laws of Congress. Congress alone must act on these positions. The citizens of the United States have paid for these jobs with their taxes. It is not right or just for the government to take more than it needs from the people. President Jefferson also wanted to cut taxes on the production and sale of some products, including whiskey and tobacco. He hoped the government could get all the money it needed from import taxes and from the sale of public lands. The Federalists were furious. They warned that Jefferson's financial program would crush the nation. They declared there would be anarchy if Federalist officials were dismissed. Most people, however, were happy. They liked what Jefferson said. They especially liked his plan to cut taxes. <music> 
Jefferson's biggest critic was his longtime political opponent, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton had served as the nation's first Treasury Secretary. Now he was a private lawyer in New York City. He published his criticism of Jefferson in a newspaper he started, the New York Evening Post. In Congress, elected officials also debated the president's proposal to cut taxes. Federalists said it was dangerous for the government to depend mainly on import taxes. They said such a policy would lead to smuggling. People would try to bring goods into the United States secretly without paying customs fees on them. Federalists also said that if the United States cut taxes, it would not have enough money to pay its debts. Then no one would want to invest in the United States again. Republicans said they were not afraid of smugglers. The danger, they said, would come from taxing the American people. There was no need for production and sales taxes. And they said the American people knew it. The Republicans also said they were sure the government would have enough money to pay its debts. The Republicans won this legislative fight. Both the Senate and the House of Representatives voted to approve the president's plan to cut taxes. Congress also had another of Jefferson's proposals to debate. Jefferson wanted to reduce the number of federal courts. The issue had roots in the political divisions between the Federalist and Republican parties. And it started in the closing days of the previous president's term. John Adams was a Federalist. Before Adams left office, Congress passed a Judiciary Act. This act gave Adams the power to appoint as many judges as he wished. The act was a way for the Federalists to keep control of one branch of government after losing the presidency and their majority in Congress in the election of 1800. So President Adams quickly created new courts and named new judges. Just as quickly, the Senate approved them. The papers of appointment were signed. The appointed men were known as midnight judges. However, some of the midnight judges did not receive their papers or commissions before Thomas Jefferson was sworn into office. The new president refused to give them their commissions. Federalist congressmen claimed that the president was trying to interfere with the judiciary. This interference, they said, violated the Constitution. Republican congressmen argued that the Constitution gave Congress the power to create and eliminate courts. They said the former administration had no right to appoint the so-called midnight judges. The Republicans won this argument, too. Congress approved President Jefferson's proposal to reduce the federal courts. Congress then turned to other business. But the question of the midnight judges would not die. One reason the issue remained important was because of a man named William Marbury. Marbury was one of the midnight judges who had never received his commission. He asked the Supreme Court to decide whether the government was required to give him his commission. The Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, was a member of the Federalist Party. Jefferson and Marshall hate each other. In fact, Marshall gives him the oath for the inauguration, 
and goes back to his room and says, well, a terrorist has just taken over the government. I hope we will be able to survive him. Joseph Ellis is a historian who has written many books about early American history. He says John Marshall was a towering figure who had an entirely different view of the federal government than Jefferson. Marshall believed the Supreme Court should have the right to veto bills passed by Congress and signed by the president. In the Marbury case, he saw a chance to put this idea into law. Marshall wrote his decision carefully. First, he said that Marbury did have a legal right to his judicial commission. Then, he said that Marbury had been denied this legal right. He said no one, not even the president, could take away a person's legal rights. Next, Marshall noted that Marbury had taken his request to the Supreme Court under the terms of a law passed in 1789. That law gave citizens the right to ask the high court to order action by any lower court or by any government official. Marshall explained that the Constitution carefully limits the powers of the Supreme Court. The court can hear direct requests involving diplomats or the states. It cannot rule on other cases until a lower court has ruled. So, Marshall said, the 1789 law allowed Marbury to take his case directly to the Supreme Court. But the Constitution did not. The Constitution, he added, is the first law of the land. Therefore, the Congressional law is unconstitutional and has no power. Chief Justice Marshall succeeded in doing all he had hoped to do. He made clear that Marbury had a right to his judicial commission. He also saved himself from a battle with the administration. Most importantly, he claimed for the Supreme Court the power to rule on laws passed by Congress. The case of Marbury v. Madison established that the Supreme Court, not the President or the Congress, has the final say on what the Constitution means. Jefferson did not like Marshall's decision, but Joseph Ellis says that Jefferson was awed by how the Chief Justice argued his case. Jefferson says to his friends, if you ever talk to Marshall, don't say anything, because whatever you say, he will take it and he will twist it. He calls about twistification, Sir John Marshall. Jefferson waited for the Supreme Court to use this new power to change Congress's laws. Several times during Jefferson's presidency, Federalists claimed that laws passed by the Republican Congress violated the Constitution. But they never asked the Supreme Court to reject those laws. The case of Marbury v. Madison was one of the most important decisions about how America's government operates. But historians say another act during Thomas Jefferson's presidency affected America in an even bigger way. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 